Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So we have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we get into today's episode. Uh Uh-huh. If you are a listener, you may be wondering what happened to that trip to Italy we were planning. (laughs) That trip to Italy that we've been planning since late 2019. Right, for two years now. So uh, it was originally planned for a certain date that got pushed back for pandemic. We've pushed it a few times. It is currently back on for May of 2022. Yes, it it had been originally planned to happen maybe essentially as when this episode is coming out. But it just seems much safer for everyone to try to postpone it again for hopefully, fingers crossed, last time. Yeah. 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 And if you are interested in that trip, uh, I can promise you we had an absolute blast on our last trip when we went to France, and I expect nothing but the same on this one. Uh, We are going to do some very fun stuff. And if you're interested, you can go to defineddestinations.com slash Rome dash Florence. That will give you the whole scoop on all that's planned. Uh, And I I know there's been some shifting. A lot of people have stuck with it. So if you're one of our listeners that registered way, way back in the beginning, in the before times, and you've stuck it out and you're still planning to come with us, fantastic. If you are someone who wasn't in on that and now you think you want to, there are still some spaces left. Uh, So please uh, take a peek at that. And if it looks delicious and fun for you, and I think it's going to be both of those things, we'd love to have you with us. Yeah. All right. And now uh, we are getting into today's topic. So This involves colors, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. So we mentioned the creation of synthetic dye on the podcast before, most specifically on our 2014 episode on the history of colors. But the chemist who stumbled onto mauve dye, which you will sometimes hear pronounced mauve as well, which is how I said it growing up and now I've transitioned to mauve. But if I say it mauve, that's just because it's ingrained from 40 plus years before I decided to change it up. Uh, That man is often lauded as having changed the world, which is a pretty significant thing to say about a person. And William Henry Perkin is unique in that he saw how quickly the world of industry changed in response to his innovation. So today we're going to talk about his life and how, yes, creating mauve was the beginning And that's something he did while still quite young. But it wasn't as though he made this discovery and then just let that be the thing that defined him. He then hustled and turned that discovery into a business and continued to innovate. And he ushered in a new field of commercially oriented chemistry. William Henry Perkin was born on March 12th, 1838, at 3 King David Lane in Shadwell, London. His father was George Fowler Perkin, who was a carpenter and a builder. And that might sound like a really humble start, but the builder there is more like a general contractor, and George Perkin was really successful. His seven children, of which William Henry was the last, had a private school in easy walking distance of the family home. That was the Arbor Terrace School, which William Henry attended. And William was a very smart kid. Uh, Pretty much every biography of him just mentions how curious and intellectual he was for a child. And he was interested in all kinds of things, from music to art to science. And when he was 14, he took a self-portrait photograph. That's become a really common image that pops up when you look at Perkins' name. And that's notable, considering that the daguerreotype had only been introduced 13 years earlier when he was still a baby. And by the time Perkins took his own photo, he had been dabbling in photography for about two years. So that speaks both to his ingenuity in new technology, as well as the family's wealth in being able to afford the supplies needed for a budding 14-year-old photographer to kind of muck around and play with things. Early in his life, William was steered toward architecture as a career. His father encouraged him in that direction. And that actually seems like it could have been a pretty good match for his intellect and temperament because it would have combined his interest and curiosity in things like engineering and mechanics with a natural ability in art. William is said to have drawn and painted very well and even started copying over architectural plans while he was a boy. So he seemed amenable to the idea of a career as an architect. 
But the moment that got him passionately interested in chemistry took place when he was still 12 years old. He saw a friend doing some very basic experiments with crystals, and he would later write about how much this got him thinking about chemistry and its possibilities, saying, quote, The possibility also of making new discoveries impressed me very much. I determined, if possible, to accumulate bottles of chemicals and make experiments. Shortly after this revelation, William started attending the City of London School, He took chemistry classes as not an elective, because that wasn't even an option, but as sort of an a la carte add-on to his class schedule. For an extra seven shillings each term, Perkin was enrolled in lunchtime classes twice a week, so he needed to skip his lunch to go to class. And he was willing to do it, because not only did Perkin perform chemistry experiments also when he was at home, under advisement of his chemistry teacher, Thomas Hall, but he also attended additional chemistry lectures around London. He clearly was into this. He went to London Hospital to hear Henry Leatherby speak on the subject. And then he was also able to get permission from Michael Faraday to sit in on his electricity lectures at the Royal Institution. Perkin enrolled at the Royal College of Chemistry in 1853 at the age of 15. He had needed to convince his father that this was a good plan. He had gotten his chemistry teacher to help him in that effort. One of the reasons that George Perkin was initially pretty wary of the idea was that chemistry as a career was not really established. There just weren't many jobs to be had. But between William and his teacher, Thomas Hall, they made the case that this field had potential and George Perkin finally acquiesced. And at the Royal College of Chemistry, Perkin studied under August Wilhelm von Hoffmann. And William quickly showed a very high degree of aptitude as well as dedication to the field of chemistry, and Hoffmann made Perkin an honorary assistant. He seems to have been just about obsessed with this field. As we mentioned, he was doing so much extra work in chemistry. And at this point, he converted his room at home into a rudimentary lab. He recalled this setup later in life, writing, quote, My private laboratory occupied half a long room and a few shelves for little bottles and a table. In my fireplace, I had even constructed an oven. I worked with an old Berzelius alcohol lamp, and I did the burnings with charcoal in a shed. And in this laboratory, I worked nights and during vacations. Perkin wrote his first published work on the production of menaphthalamine through combining cyanogen chloride with naphthalene in 1856. He was also promoted to a staff position in the lab that year, And then, when he was 18, Perkins started his famous project, which uh, he intended to synthesize quinine. And this was a vacation project. The school was closed for Easter break. So his teacher and mentor, Hoffman, had suggested years earlier, back in 1849, that naphthalene could be used to prepare synthetic quinine. And quinine, of course, was in high demand for its curative powers, specifically for treating malaria. So finding a way to synthesize it in a lab instead of having to extract it from a bark was a rather thrilling prospect. And again... Perkin was a striver. And coal tar, which was rich in amino compounds and was considered a pollutant, was also considered a potential solution to this problem. But the quinine eluded Perkin. His first attempt resulted in a reddish-brown material that was not at all what he was after. In his second attempt, he combined aniline sulfate with potassium dichromate, and this resulted in a black precipitate, still not quinine. Then there are two versions of this story. In one version, he was washing his lab equipment after this failure and noticed that the black goo he had created left a purple residue and that it stained a cloth. And in the other, he decided to try to salvage something out of this unsuccessful result and tried an extraction of the black precipitate with methanol. What he got was a mauve matter. Whichever of those versions played out, and it's possible that it could be kind of some overlap between them, he ended up with a purple substance that got the name movine. Okay, that's not a particularly common word. So (laughs) in plainer terms, he had accidentally discovered how to synthesize purple dye using an abundant source material that was considered garbage. So the name mauve is derived from the old French word for mallow because of that plant's pale purple flowers. So that's why it's called mauvine. 
There's a lot of writing about how much credit has to be given to Perkin regarding his insight here. And that's because it would have been easy to see that his result was not quinine as he had hoped, and then to write up the experiment and discard the seemingly incorrect result. But Perkins saw that he had possibly come up with something interesting, even if it had missed his intended target. So he next replicated the process, and then he started refining it to always get the mauve material on purpose. His older brother, Thomas Dix Perkin, assisted him in these experiments. And then he got the idea to test it as a dye and to see if it had potential as a commercial product. So he first did a series of experiments dyeing silk samples with his movine, and then he sent those samples to the J. Puller and Son dye house to get their opinion. And the letter he got back from Robert Puller read, quote, If your discovery does not make the goods too expensive, it is decidedly one of the most valuable that has come out for a very long time. This color is one which has been very much wanted in all classes of goods and could not be obtained fast on silks and only at great expense on cotton yarns. I enclose you a pattern of the best lilac we have on cotton. It is dyed by only one house in the United Kingdom, but even this is not quite fast and does not stand the tests that yours does and fades by exposure to air. So this letter had to be a rather thrilling read for a young man who had been drawn to chemistry as a preteen because of the potential of discovering new things. And this person is basically like, yes, you did, and we really want it. (laughs) A close friend of his, Arthur H. Church, who was also an assistant at the lab at the Royal College of Chemistry, suggested that Perkin get a patent on his dye as quickly as possible. There was a little bit of a hiccup here because normally the patent office would only grant patents to inventors who were 21 or older. William was younger than that, but William and his brother prepared a sample, and then on the advice of legal counsel, he applied for a patent anyway. That was granted on August 26, 1856. So coming up, we're going to talk about how Perkin turned this discovery into an industry, but first, we will pause for a sponsor break. Once Perkin had refined his method for creating movine and he'd run it by those dyers, his next move was to set up a plant to make it. This was the start of an incredibly lucrative career in chemical manufacture, but it was at the time not a sure thing at all. Even though his purple, which he called a few different things, including movine, aniline purple, and Tyrian purple, had received enthusiastic support from the dye mill, this was not an industry that really existed at the time. Other dyes were still sourced from nature, not created synthetically. And he couldn't be certain that dye mills would be willing to use his product or that they would be happy with the result. Keep in mind, Perkin was still a teenager at this point. He was really smart, sure, but he had absolutely no experience in the textile industry or in manufacturing. He had been able to conduct some experimental dye runs at J. Puller & Son, and based on those, he'd been able to refine his formulas to meet the needs of specific dyeing scenarios as potential problems had been identified. So it worked a different way on silk than it did on cotton, and he kind of worked with them to figure out the best ways to get the optimal result. But even though all of this work had already been done, the risk in setting up a plant was still very significant. On top of all of that, there was the matter of Perkins' job and his mentor, August Wilhelm von Hoffman. When Perkin approached him to discuss his plan to become a full-time chemical manufacturer, it did not go spectacularly well, even though Perkin had samples to show how well his dye actually worked. But regardless of whether his professor was impressed with the work itself, he was chagrined that Perkin would step away from academic life to drop down to what the academic community saw as a demeaning manufacturing job, even if he did own the place. It's a little snooty. Um, (laughs) All of this gave Perkins' confidence a little bit of a wobble. So he consulted another dye expert in London and gave him some of the dye to test. And that dyer, named Thomas Keith, responded very positively to the results. And he urged Perkin to absolutely move forward with his business. But even so, securing capital for it, again, for a young, unproven man and a young, unproven industry, was a hurdle that was proving hard to overcome. 
Another boost to any wavering on Perkins' part came from his father. While George Perkin may have initially doubted the lucrative possibilities of a career in chemistry, by the time William's moving dye had been refined, he was really a believer. He offered to finance the startup of a dye plant. To be clear, George Perkin was wealthy, but he was still taking a huge risk here. He put most of his assets on the line for his son, so if this business failed, he would be cleaned out financially. That's got to be um, both a huge sense of, of trust and, like, feeling very loved and believed in by your parent and also stressful. <laughs> mm. um, I, I'm so glad you believe in me. Please don't let me ruin you. Uh, there was an additional and immense element of support that came from William's brother, Thomas Dix Perkin. We mentioned that he had already helped Will with his, his experiments, and Thomas had a head for business, and he had learned about construction from their father. And so he became William's partner, essentially, with the intent that William could handle the development and science part of the business, and Thomas would take care of any business administration. So once he had signed on to manage such things, William Perkin was in a fairly good place to start this business, even though it did still have risks. And soon, they had set up Perkin and Sons as a company, and they bought a plot of land at Greenford Green in Middlesex. From there, they had to start not just a business, but really a whole industry from scratch, No one had plans for a chemical manufacturing plant, so they had to be drawn up according to what they thought they would need. Additionally, Perkins Company had to figure out a supply chain for the raw materials that they needed in large quantities. That posed its own problem. For example, the benzene that was required could only be sourced from a coal tar distiller in Glasgow, but the benzene that the company offered was crude and required a whole other distillation process once it got to the plant. And that same sort of problem happened again and again with other materials. But Perkin and his brother worked through these issues, and in December of 1857, they delivered their first order to Thomas Keith & Sons Dyers. Almost immediately, it became apparent that while the pigment itself was consistent, the way that fabrics took the dye was not. And William had worked on this a little bit at the Puller Company, but there were still some things to work out. So silk, for example, would take the dye so rapidly that if it wasn't applied in a completely uniform manner, the color would be darker or more intense anywhere the fabric had been in the dye longer than another. Perkin worked with dyers to fix this problem and similarly found ways to ensure that other textiles less prone to quickly bond with dye would also uptake the pigment. And soon he had developed, of course, not only this dye, but also fixatives as well as application processes that textile dyers then implemented. Perkin ran into another problem with the dye business. Due to a paperwork error, the patent that Perkin & Sons held in France for purple dye was invalid, and soon French plants started creating moving for dye houses there. That cut Perkin out of a significant revenue source. And this was particularly true because France became absolutely incest with this dye. Empress Eugenie, wife of Napoleon III, wore it and set this trend for the entire country to want purple garments. An even bigger unofficial endorsement came from Queen Victoria, though. Queen Victoria wore a gown, dyed with Perkins moving to her daughter's wedding. And from there, the popularity of the color spread throughout Europe and the U.S. at a really rapid pace. Despite losing out on that French business and because of the high-profile appearance of his dye on the Queen's gown, Perkins' own business was booming. And keep in mind... He had only just set up this dye manufacture plant, and people were already setting up kind of copycat plants to do dye in France. So he had already started this entire new industry. His Movine dye cost 120 pounds per kilo, but it also took a lot of raw material to produce. So according to Perkins' calculations, it took 100 pounds of coal to get 10 pounds, 12 ounces of coal tar, which he used to get the movine. And from that, 10 pounds, 12 ounces, the yield of movine after all of the chemical processes were complete was just one quarter of an ounce. But still, this was a superior option to natural means of accruing enough purple pigment to achieve a saturated purple tone in textiles. And Perkins' synthetic version was more color fast. He had had the good fortune to stumble onto a synthetic purple at exactly the right time. Purple had been on the rise in popularity, and the options to get it had been limited until his discovery. 
Just a couple of years into their chemical manufacturing venture, it became apparent to William, Thomas, and George that the original plant just couldn't keep up with demand. A new facility was built in 1859, and from there they expanded their catalog to include more colors. The most popular were mauve, another purple tone that was called Britannia Violet, and Perkins Green. Over time, their color offerings were not used exclusively in the textile industry because Perkin and Sons dyes were the first synthetic dyes to make their way onto postage stamps. Coming up, we're going to talk about how Perkin eventually stepped away from this industry he had created and what happened to his life after that. But first, we'll hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. A synthetic red dye proved to be difficult to create for a number of years. Thomas Dix Perkin had actually patented a magenta manufacture process in 1859 that the plant used briefly, but that involved handling mercury, and that process was shut down completely when their workers started to become ill. Perkin, working to find an improved process, produced artificial alizarin, that's a crimson dye, from anthracene in 1869. And when he filed his patent on it, he discovered that another patent for essentially the same process had been filed the prior day by chemists working for the German company BASF. While they were both issued patents, Perkin then refined the technique with a different process, and that made him able to manufacture it before BASF could get it to market. This seemed like a big potential problem, but the two companies eventually came to an agreement that allowed Perkin and Son the English market pretty much on their own to monopolize. William Henry Perkin married for the first time in 1859 when he was 21. His bride, Jemima Harriet Lissette, was his first cousin. This couple had two children together. They were William Henry Perkin Jr., who was born in 1860, and then another son, Arthur George Perkin, the following year, Unfortunately, though, Jemima died of tuberculosis in 1861, which left William Sr. with two infant sons. Perkin remarried five years later to Alexandria Caroline Malwo, who went by Sasha. He and Sasha had a son, Frederick, followed by four daughters, Sasha, Lucy, Annie, and Helen Mary. The dye manufacturing plant was a thriving business, but the Perkin brothers were also constantly operating at kind of a breakneck pace. And part of that for William was that he wanted to continue his other experiments, which were not exclusively in the development of pigments. Perkin had another significant chemistry achievement in 1858. That year, he worked alongside another scientist, B.F. Duppa, and the two produced the first lab-created version of glycine. Glycine is an amino acid, and that was the first amino acid produced in a lab setting. With the same collaborator, Perkins synthesized tartaric acid two years later in 1860, and he was publishing about these findings and other experiments throughout his time running the business. Yeah, he kept his hand in in the scientific world throughout. Another process that Perkins developed while he was still in the synthetic dye business was what's called the Perkin reaction. I am not a chemist, and I will mess this up if I try to extrapolate from a definition into plainer terms. So I am going to read the Merriam-Webster definition of a Perkin reaction here, and it is, quote, a reaction for making an unsaturated aromatic acid as cinnamic acid by heating an aromatic aldehyde with an acid anhydride as acidic anhydride in the presence of a base as sodium acetate or potassium carbonate. I don't want to dunk on Merriam-Webster because I use Merriam-Webster all the time, but I still have a number of questions after (laughs) you read that. (laughs) But basically what this means is that using this method, which is a lot of chemistry stuff and I feel foolish that I don't grasp chemistry well enough to really Uh, be able to say more about it, he was able to synthesize the first artificial perfume. He made a compound called coumarin, which smells like fresh mown hay. To be clear, though, Perkin did not make this into a perfume. He just developed coumarin, and it was later used in perfumes and as a flavoring for sweets. Today, Perkin's work, both in this area and others, is cited as the launching point for organic chemistry and all of the many industries which have developed through it. After 17 years in the dye industry, William Perkin reached a point where he wanted to be doing his research more than he wanted to be running a business. 
And so on January 1st, 1874, Perkin and Sons was officially sold for 105,000 pounds. While Perkin was undoubtedly ready to start a less frantic pace of his life with his finances secure from the deal, there were some problems with this sale. The plant at Greenford Green was not well run by its new owners, which was Brooke, Simpson, and Spiller. They rapidly lost clients. This led the purchasers to claim that the Perkins had misled them, and they sued the Perkins, citing deception bordering on fraud. This matter was finally settled in March 1875 with a judge ruling in the Perkins' favor. Yeah, he was basically like, they put together a huge dossier of like, here's everything we left these people, we told them how to do it, they did it wrong. And the judge was like, yep, they sure did. Uh, So with this legal matter completed, William Perkins set up his home lab, he built a new house, and he settled into a life of research. This all sounds like a really idyllic retirement, but he was still just 37 at this point. He was a young man. In the years between founding the chemical plant and selling it, he had managed to write and publish almost two papers per year on a variety of organic chemistry subjects. Once he was free of the time limitations of industrial work, his publishing output only went up, and he wrote and published papers on his research right up until the end of his life. He also continued to enjoy art and music throughout his life, and he was able to enjoy more of these pastimes and share them with his kids in his post-industry years. In 1906, the 50th anniversary of Perkins' synthesis of Movine, he was knighted, and there were jubilee celebrations to mark the half-century birthday of his revolutionary chemical accident. The official name of this anniversary festivity was the International Celebration of the Coal Tar Color Jubilee. It consisted of a lot of events for Perkins to attend all around Britain and abroad. When he traveled to the U.S. that year, he was elected an honorary fellow of the American Chemical Society. As part of that honor, he was given a silver punch bowl, and he said it would be good for lemonade. This is a good-natured nod to his being a teetotaler. Perkin never drank. At that same ceremony, he was given the Perkin Medal of the American Chemical Society. That was a first. That medal is still issued annually for, quote, innovation in applied chemistry resulting in outstanding commercial development. One of these celebration events, which took place at the Royal Institution, this is kind of like the culmination event, was described this way, quote, Sir William H. Perkin, on his appearance, was received with loud and prolonged cheers. There was a large attendance of representatives of scientific societies and of commercial organizations interested in the coal tar color industry a great many ladies were also present. At that event, the chairman of the Royal Institution, Professor R. Medola, gave a brief speech which included, quote, the object for which we are assembled on the present occasion is so well known to most of you that in the view of the long program before us, I do not propose to occupy your attention myself for more than a very few moments. It will, I am sure, be your wish in the first place that we should take this opportunity of offering our hearty congratulations to the founder of the coal tar color industry on having lived to witness the consummation of his labors, which we are celebrating on this 50th anniversary. Yeah, so there was no doubt during his lifetime that people thought he had really uh, completely invented this entire new field. And when Perkin wrapped up his time at the Jubilee, he concluded his final speech with, quote, When I look back on my life and consider all the ways I have been led, above all, I thank God to whom I owe everything for all his goodness to me and ascribe to him all the praise and honor. Perkin was Methodist, and his religion was an integral part of his identity and how he lived his life. He made a lot of money in the chemical color industry, and he gave a lot of it away. He provided a fund to build a Methodist church in Sudbury, and he thought being a job creator was one of the best achievements of their company's success. In July of 1907, Perkin, who had just gotten through all of this travel, which was celebrating him but really took a toll on him, started to feel ill. And he did not seek medical help for several days because he was a a bit wary of doctors. He also didn't think whatever was going on was serious. He did speak with a dietician because he did not realize that he had pneumonia and that also his appendix had burst. A doctor was finally called in, but it was too late, and Perkin died on July 14, 1907. 
Perkins' obituary in the Journal of the Society of Dyers and Colorists read in part, quote, his neighbors at Sudbury loved him for his quiet philanthropy. His generous courtesy and kindness of heart were striking characteristics, which strangely attached him to all those with whom he was personally acquainted. Aside from the fact that everything from anesthetics to artificial sweeteners are often traced back to the work that Perkin did, he also left a legacy in chemistry through his children. Perkin's sons all had careers that followed in their father's footsteps. William Henry Perkin Jr. was considered Great Britain's finest organic chemist during his life, and Arthur eventually became head of the Department of Color Chemistry at University of Leeds. Frederick, his son from his second marriage, became a pioneer in low-temperature carbonization. So his his tendrils in science just kept, like, going on and on and on and on. Uh, and we are still, I think, uh, you could make a, a firm case enjoying the benefits of his work today. Um, I obviously love the color purple. So mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he's an interesting one and uh, seems to have maintained a fairly kind and low-key attitude throughout his life. Uh, We'll talk about that a bit more in our behind the scenes. Uh, And now I have a listener mail about some of our Halloween fun. This one is about haunted houses, and it's from our listener Barb, who writes, Hi, ladies. I love the show and especially look forward to your October episodes. I'm also a huge fan of haunted houses, so after hearing this week's episode on the history of them, I knew I needed to write in. As a kid, I have fond memories of going through our local haunted house each year with my dad. It was an old, possibly even abandoned house on the end of my block and was run by the JCs. My dad started taking me as a pretty young child, maybe four or five. His favorite story to tell is about the first time we went. At the end of the haunted house, just as you exited, there was a person who would chase you with a, quote, chainsaw. I'm pretty sure it was just the motor without a blade, but that sound was scary enough in the dark. My dad said I jumped a few feet in the air and my feet were moving before they hit the ground. I was out of there. One might think this experience would keep me away. Nope, not me. I was hooked. We went every year, sometimes more than once. When I was a little older, I would talk my friends into going with me as well. I even dragged my now husband to a haunted schoolhouse, which had become one of my favorites to visit as a date. I had no idea about the changes in safety measures for haunted houses over the years. Our haunted house at the end of the block moved to a new location in the early 90s, so your episode shed some light on why that might have been. Thanks so much for all the spooky October episodes. I had the pleasure to see you in person at the October 2019 live event in Chicago and meet you afterwards. You were both so gracious and a delight to me. Hope you can come back to our area once live shows start back up. Thanks again, Barb. Barb, I hope so, too. I need three. <laughs> um, I miss touring, and I love Chicago. I would love to do, uh, um, I don't know that Tracy would agree, I would do, like, a two-month-long tour of every city we've ever hit and then some because we haven't done it in so long. <laughs> you know, I, if, as long as we had, like, a break day built like in. Like, every three days, we take yeah. a break day, yeah. Or four maximum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because day five of a tour, I would, be, I don't my know my name would, anymore. Yeah. No. I, that's how I would, like, I would wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and my body would try to take me to where the room had the bathroom in a different hotel. Yes. And I would wind up in a corner, like, where am I? Yes. I think there was a time where you texted me once and asked me what airport I had landed in, and I told you I did not know. <laughs> that's um, correct. And I, and then when I got to the baggage claim, I recognized the airport and was like, oh, here's where I am. I'm fine. Because we were in a city with multiple airports. And I was like, I don't know. Um, you know, that's how it works when you're touring. Your brain mm-hmm. gets a little fuzzy on your whereabouts. But Barb, thank you again so much. And I'm glad that that was a fun episode. And also, like, I just love hearing people's lifelong affinities for haunts and all of the fun that Halloween and October can bring. For sure. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, that's super duper easy. You can do it right now if you want. You can find that on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. 
For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.